Thank you for joining the worship services of Shoto, Brady, and Dutton United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor Julie King, and I'm so grateful for digital technology that allows you to join us from wherever you are in the world. You can join us every week by clicking the links on our Facebook at facebook.com slash Shoto UMC or on our website at umshoto.net. If you like what we are doing and would like to financially support us in ministry, you can find more contact information on our website. And again, that's umshoto.net. We're so grateful that you are joining us. After reading through this at home, just to see if I knew all the words to come out of the Bible, I had a question. <laughs> um, what kind of body would you choose if you could? Would it be strong? Would it be athletic? Would it be beautiful? Would it be this or that? Usually it's usually something we're not. But we don't have that choice. But Paul explains the resurrected body, res resurrected body will be recognizable, yet it will be better than we can imagine. For it will be made to live forever. We will still have our own personality and individuality, but there will be a it will be perfected through Christ. So listen to God's word through the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 38, the resurrection body. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they become? Fool, what do you sow? What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God, give, but God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. And from 1 Corinthians, also chapter 15, 42nd verse through 50th. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. It is sown with dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown with a phys physical body, it is raised with a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of dust. And is the man of heaven, so are those from heaven. Just as we have been born in the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. So I have to say, I love God moments. The fact that you said when you read through the scripture you had a question is so fitting for what I want to talk about in this sermon. This scripture talking about the resurrected body kind of continues a little bit from last week. Last week we were at the beginning of the 15th chapter and Paul was trying to make sense of this resurrected body and this week he's really carrying on with that. And he says, some people are going to question this and they're going to wonder, what is this resurrected body all about? As I read through this scripture reading this week, I was reminded of a conversation my grandma and I had. I think it was when she came up here for Thanksgiving. It may have been on the phone though. But regardless, in our conversation, she had said, you know, I always thought I had a pretty good understanding of what happens or what my thinking of heaven will be like after we die. But ever since your grandpa passed, I've really struggled with this. I really wonder 
what happens after we die? And I think Grandpa must have figured out something that I don't know. It's normal for big moments in our life to make us question what we have always known, what we have always believed in Scripture. And I think questioning the Scripture and not having a good black and white understanding of what it says is a good thing. Something that has jumped out this last week to me is that three separate people on three separate days have asked me the exact same question. That does not happen very often. And the question that was asked this week by these three people was, which translation of the Bible is the best? Well, <laughs> my answer to that question is that there are well over 1,200 different versions of the Bible. The Bible, just the, in its full entirety, has been translated over 700 times. The New Testament has been translated over 1,500 times. And if you add all those together, there's been over 3,000 different translations of the Bible that have taken place throughout time. It's also interesting to point out that up until about the 1,500s, those different translations didn't exist. All of that happened over the last five to 600 years. Prior to that, the Bible was spoken to people through the priest. It was in the original Latin language and not all the priests read and spoke Latin. They could probably read it to the best of their ability, but they didn't speak Latin in their first language. It was definitely a second or third language for them. People, ordinary people, didn't have a copy of the Bible at home. And so they got the scripture by going to church. That's interesting to think about because while you hope that every translation and interpretation of what that priest was reading was getting presented to the people and spoken correctly, there is obviously going to be some error in that. And one can also assume that a priest might have read through and said, yeah, I think it says this, but I wish it said this, and they don't know any difference. So that's what it's going to say. And nobody questioned the priest <laughs> at all during those times. All these translations began taking place, and it is readily available to everyone now, which is a wonderful thing. But it's also important for us to remember that it was written down by human beings, and it was scribed multiple times. Scribing back then was not easy. They had to do it all by hand. There was surely some error that occurred. And then after all these multiple thousands of translations, we cannot say in certainty that that is exactly what was written down 2,000 years ago, or almost 2,000 years ago. I'm going to do something a little bit different in my sermon, and I'd like to invite Xander to come forward. Where did he disappear to, Xander? <laughs> he knows he's coming up. The reason I'm inviting Xander to come forward, though, is because over the last several weeks, over at our Connect group, we have some 6th and 7th grade boys. And these boys are fascinating to talk to. We've been asking them some of these questions that I'm about to ask Xander. And I wanted you guys to get an understanding of what it's like having these conversations with these kids. So I asked Xander if he'd be willing to be my guinea pig this morning. But one of the questions that we've talked about is, who wrote the Bible? Uh, many people who believed in God. Many people who believed in God. Pretty good answer. Was it God that wrote the Bible? No. God didn't just write it with, you know, lightning or something like that. It was many people. Is the Bible 100% true? No. No? How can the Bible not be true? Because there's two stories of David and Goliath. That's a great example. Did you know that? There are two stories of David and Goliath in there. There's the David and Goliath story that we know, but then there's another version, and I can't even remember the guy's name, but it's not David. And there's two versions. Why would there be different versions? Because people have different beliefs. They have different beliefs? Why else might there be different stories in the Bible? They believe different things. 
Yeah. Would they maybe remember it different? Yeah. What did we do yesterday? Do you remember what we did yesterday? We cleaned. Yeah. Did you clean without me asking you? No. I have a different recollection of what we did yesterday. For me, I took a great nap and woke up thinking I had missed church. That was the big part of my day. <laughs> but it's amazing how we remember different parts of the day. Do you think some of those Bible authors could have remembered the same experience differently? Yeah, probably so. Which Bible translation is your favorite? Well, that's a story in the Bible. Which Bible to read is your favorite? Um, the audio book. The audiobook. That's one they didn't have 2,000 years ago. <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> How do you learn about the Bible? Or the stories in the Bible? You read it? Or listen to it? Where have you personally learned about the stories in the Bible? Church. At church? Have it, has it always been from me? No. Where else have you learned it? From other people, yeah. So we learn the Bible, of course, from Sunday school as a children. We learn from our parents. We can read it ourselves, right? Lots of different things. When we talk about this scripture today, it's talking about a resurrected body. What does that mean to you? Either what we go to heaven or two, we are reincarnated as a being for Oh, oh, well, we got two different theories here. So it could be one, we go to heaven, or two could be reincarnation and we forget our past life. We don't know. It could be. I like these answers. Thanks. You can go sit down. <laughs> so thank you for being a good sport, Xander. <laughs> One of the joys of being a PK. <laughs> As you can see, kids have a good way of interpreting things and they have a good way of giving us answers exactly how it is. Some things that came up in multiple conversations this week was the way that when most of us were taught the Bible, we learned it in church or we learned it from our parents and we read it exactly as the people teaching us taught it. We didn't really question it very much and if we did ask why, the answer was a typical mom or dad answer of because I said so and then you really didn't question it. <laughs> Today, we have the ability to find the answers to our multiple questions at our fingertips. Most of us have access to Google. And even myself, there are multiple times the translations of one single word or, hey, I wonder how that got to be will come up in my mind and I instantly pull out my phone and try to find the answer. One of those that came up this week during our Bible study, we were talking about how long have they been saying amen at the end of a prayer and where did that come from? And we looked it up, it goes clear back to Hebrew, and from all of that time, the spelling is almost the same. Of course, in modern English today, we either say it amen or amen, and there's been a few different variations of the pronunciation, different accent marks in the word, but for the most part, it's been the same from the beginning of prayer time as far as it's written and documented. Interesting to think about. Another thing that was interesting to think about is the way that our language and our understanding of words change over time. This began as a conversation again with our com confirmation and sixth and seventh grade youth over there, but we ended up talking about it more at home just because it fascinated me. My kids and Robert and I were talking about different words and I'm learning very quickly as a mom of a teenager, a 13-year-old and two preteens, that there's just some language that has proved to me I'm not as cool of a mom as I think that I am sometimes. <laughs> Do any of you know what dripping is? Apparently that is the new lingo for being very fashionable. I'm dripping today, <laughs> very trending. <laughs> My kids also, anytime that they come 
encounter something that they think is strange or unusual, they'll be like, oh, that's so sus, meaning suspicious. And of course, everything in today's world with the youth is so satisfying. Anything is satisfying. <laughs> we joked around with the kids and said, well, do you know what it means when I'm like, dude, or sweet, or that's so cool. And the kids are like, you're so weird. <laughs> and then we got to talking about things that my parents would have said and my grandparents would have said. And I will tell you, their definition of the word groovy is very different than what most of us would know the definition of groovy to be. Words change just in a generation. Every 10 to 15 years, our understanding changes. So when we read through scripture that was written down in a Bible translation that's even 40 or 50 years old, those words can have a very different meaning to us than maybe what that person intended them to mean or what they meant at the time that they were written. It's especially different when we're talking about the words and the letters of Paul who was speaking and preaching and teaching almost 2,000 years ago. His situations and the people and what they were going through in their life may have been comparable to ours. Their questions may have been the same. But he talked to them in the context of what they knew. So sometimes we have to understand things in our own context. And it's not always black and white. There's a gray area. My point with bringing all of this up is that, as I said, I'm so glad that you said that you had a question when you read through the scripture. Because reading through this scripture for today began stirring some questions in my own mind. And I have to admit, I don't know that I necessarily like this translation that we read through. Because it makes me have more questions than answers about what happens afterwards. I pulled out the message. The message is a Bible that was translated by Eugene Peterson. He was a Presbyterian pastor in Maryland for 25-ish years, around 25 years. He's also, also the author of several books. He was a poet, very, very educated person. He ended up leaving ministry, though, because of his views on homosexuality. And as us in the Methodist church know, that is a very hot topic in churches. And that's not the point of our discussion today, but he did end up leaving ministry for that. And he moved to a town that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, Lakeside, Montana. And that is where he lived when he ended up passing away. But it took him 10 years and he translated what is considered to be now the most contemporary version of the Bible. There's a lot of controversy on it, but I do like turning to it to see what it says, and I really like what it says about this scripture. So I want to read that translation to you today. The message version of this text says, Some skeptic is sure to ask, Show me how resurrection works. Give me a diagram. Draw me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at this question closely, you realize how absurd it is. There are no diagrams for this type of thing. We do have a parallel experience in gardening. You plant a dead seed. Soon there's a flourishing plant. There's no visual likeness between seed and plant. You could never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at the tomato seed. What we plant in the soil and what grows out of it don't look anything alike. The dead body that we bury in the ground and the resurrection body that comes from it will be dramatically different. He goes on, picking up in verse 42, to say that this image of planting a dead seed and raising a live plant is a mere sketch at best. But perhaps it will help in approaching the mystery of the resurrection body. But only if you keep in mind that we're raised. And when we are raised, we are raised for good, alive forever. The corpse that is planted is no beauty, but when it's raised, it's glorious. 
put in the ground weak, it comes up powerful. The seed sown is natural. The seed grown is supernatural. Same seed, same body. But what a difference from when it goes down in physical mortality to when it is raised up in spiritual mortality. I'm going to stop there because the rest of it, he just goes on through Adam and he's essentially saying the same thing, but I really like what he has to say in this translation. All of us might be able to recognize what a grain of wheat looks like and we'll have a picture in our head already of what wheat grown looks like in a field. Same thing if we see an apple seed or a tomato seed, we can picture the fruit. But if we were to show that to a young child, somebody two or three years old, they would have no clue. And I love that imagery. I love thinking about our physical bodies being put into the ground and planted returning to dust, but growing into this beautiful spiritual being. This idea that somehow inside of us, if we're thinking of our body as this seed, somehow inside of us there is this spiritual, what we would probably call a soul. And the ways that we have to let that grow and nurture. And then finally at our death it is planted and then it grows into the most beautiful form that could ever exist. We might not know exactly what that looks like because as far as I know, none of us have ever been to heaven yet. If you have, please come talk to me because I would love to hear that story. But we don't have those answers. The answer to the question that my grandma had after my grandpa's passing, no one can give her a direct answer. But what we do know is that our physical body will die, our time on earth here will be gone. And what comes after that is beyond anything that we can comprehend. The words glorious or amazing probably don't even come close to actually describing it. For me, as we've been going through this building character sermon series, I think that the idea of knowing that it's okay to question what the scripture says, it's okay to think differently about it, and to allow ourselves to begin growing and nurturing that spirit that is inside of us, I think that's very important. Over the last several weeks, we've talked about identifying our spiritual gifts, we've talked about the importance of each of us as unique parts of the body of Christ, We've talked about ways that we should grow and work together and spread that outside in the world, challenges to be a better person and to do good in everything that we do. And as we wrap up this series and we think about building character, my hope is that each of us will have the courage that those kids have to know that it's okay to question it, to know that the Bible is not black and white, to know that there are a lot of versions of these stories to know that we might learn something new, like that there's a second David and Goliath story. To know that no matter what our age is or what we've been previously taught, there's so much growing that can still happen. And that when that day comes, when we are finally raised in glory, we will be made whole. We will be planted and we will be grown and sown into this beautiful creation, this part of God's heaven, God's kingdom. And it'll be beautiful. My encouragement for all of you, especially with Lent coming up, is that you will use Lent as a time to really dive into the scripture, to use it as part of your own spiritual journey. As I said, we'll have books available for this very unique Lenten study that we'll doing, we're doing. If you'd like to order one of those books, you can. The Upper Room is also available back here, and it is a great daily devotion. And if you're not interested in either of those, let me know, and I can help you find either a weekly or daily spiritual journey for Lent. And I think that that is a wonderful way and a wonderful challenge for each of you to go through Lent and Letting yourself learn something new, reading the scripture in a different way. Our 
uh, reflection hymn that we'll sing right after this is I'll Fly Away, and it's one of my favorite hymns, which of course is often used at funerals and we think about often at the end of our life. But as we close this out, we'll be closing our service singing the hymn of promise. And the hymn of promise is one that I absolutely love and I think fits very well with this scripture. And of course, most of you probably know these words that in the bold there's a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise that butterflies will soon be free. As we go through those words, I hope that you will really take them to heart, let them fill your spirit, and then go out into this world and share that wonderful, wonderful word with others. Amen. Something God.